Hello, my name is Deborah Hurd. I'm project coordinator for the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And I'd like to welcome you to this special event. Today's panel is hosted by UNO Chris Library's Archives of Special Collections, the Department of Black Studies partner in the Charting Our Path 50 Years of Black Studies initiative. And at this point, I'd like to pause with a message from today's sponsor. This program is brought to you by Humanities Nebraska, a statewide nonprofit organization inspiring and enriching personal and public life by offering opportunities to thoughtfully engage with history and culture with additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. If you enjoy this type of programming, please consider supporting Humanities Nebraska with a contribution. Donations are matched by state and federal funds. Your support helps preserve our past and inform our future. And that's our sponsor's message. From its very beginning, Black Studies is a discipline that has been called upon to study, analyze, and critique the continuing effects of historical enslavement, colonization, land dispossession, and corporate imperialism. On that basis, we must stop to acknowledge that this university and the very city itself sits upon the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. Today, we are here to honor the movement that gave birth to this department 50 years ago. At every event this year, we have called upon the name of those students whose courage and sacrifice created this academic space. Those 54 brave Black students who risked not only arrest, but their academic careers for change. On November 10th, 1969, the arrest of the Omaha 54 for a sit-in protest in the president's office was the defining moment for a grassroots Black student movement to move beyond UNO's campus and into Omaha's Black community. It brought together Omaha's Black civic, social, and religious organizations who worked together to bail out all 54 students and support them in their demands with the university's administration. But their impact was even greater than that. Their demands, your demands, forever changed the course of this entire university. Your persistence in forcing the university's administration to create space within which students can engage in the study and analysis of issues concerning African and African descended peoples from an intellectual basis that is itself grounded in the cultural logic of African and African descended peoples, not only created the academic space for a black studies department, but like at other universities around the country, it also created the space for Latino and Latin American studies, Asian and Asian American studies, Native American studies and women's studies, spaces that we know are essential to any university or college truly committed to advancing the ideals of education and its positive impact on society. Because of your commitment, the Department of Black Studies came into existence at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in 1971. This makes it one of the oldest departments in this country and one of a very few in the Great Plains region. You did that. And because of you, this department exists 50 years later the Department of Black Studies salutes you, honors you, and thanks you. So the four representatives of the Omaha 54 I would like to present to you. First we have, and we're gonna do this a little bit differently. I have warned some of them, they don't all know. <laughs> but they will know in a minute. So we begin with Dr. Karen Hayes Harris. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris is an alum of UNO where she earned three degrees, Bachelor of Science in Education, Master of Science in Leadership, and a specialist degree in Leadership and Superintendency. She earned her doctorate degree in Administration, Curriculum, and Instruction from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. She is a Professor Emeritus in, uh, excuse me, in Educational Leadership at UNO, and previously worked for the Omaha Public School District as Director of Staff Development, Principal, Administrative Assistant to the Superintendent, 
assistant principal and teacher. Dr. Hayes Harris currently resides in Kansas City, Kansas. She now serves on the Doctor of Ministry Advisory Commission at Western Baptist Bible College, Kansas City, Missouri. She is the editor and writer for The Mission, the study guide for the Women's Auxiliary Literature Department of the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated. She served on a number of committees while at UNO, and she continues her service through a number of community and church organizations, as well as serving as First Lady of the St. Andrew Missionary Baptist Church, where her husband, Reverend, Reverend Dr. Seth C. Harris Sr. serves as pastor. She and Reverend Harris are the proud parents of five children and nine grandchildren. At the time of the Omaha 54 arrest, the then Miss Karen Hayes was a sophomore. Reverend Lavelle Williams Sr. is a lifelong resident of Omaha, Nebraska and a product of the Omaha public school system. A graduate of Lothrop Elementary, Horace Mann Junior High and North High Schools. A four year journeyman carpenter graduate from Union Local 444, Reverend Williams retired after a career of nearly 30 years as a carpenter, maintenance repairer of Union Local 444 and the Omaha Housing Authority. He has served in the ministry since 1985 and currently is an associate minister at Eagle's Nest Worship Center. Within six months of the sit in, Reverend Williams was married. And he is now the father of seven children, 33 grandchildren, and 27 great grandchildren. <laughs> At the time of the arrest, Reverend Williams was an 18 year old first semester freshman. Next, we have Dr. Catherine Pope. Dr. Pope is an alum of UNO, where she earned both a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science degree in speech pathology and audiology. She earned a second master's in school administration from International University. These laid the foundation for a career in education from which she retired as principal from the San Diego Unified School District. Retirement has allowed her more time for the many activities and important causes to which she has dedicated her life. She completed a doctor of education in organizational leadership from Nova Southeastern University in conjunction with the Ohio State University. She has served as adjunct professor at Point Loma Nazarene University, published an autobiography in search of the crown, now in, it, now in its second edition, that documents her achievement as the first African-American woman to win and serve as Miss Omaha in the Miss America pageant franchise. She has received many awards for her leadership in education from San Diego County, the state of California, and the US Congress. In Omaha, she has been a main speaker and honoree for the UNO Women's Archive Project. In Omaha, Mayor Jean Stothert named a week after her, citing Dr. Pope's courage during the civil rights movement while reigning as Miss Omaha. Dr. Pope currently resides in San Diego, California. When arrested in November, 1969, she was a 19 year old sophomore. And finally, we have Mr. Michael Moroni. Ms. Moroni is an alum of UNO, earning both a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Studies and a Master's of Business Administration through the Executive MBA program at UNO. Ms. Moroni uses his business acumen in service to his community, which includes serving on several boards and numerous professional organizations. He has helped to establish the city's first micro business development program developed several senior citizen complexes, as well as the first market rate single family homes in North Omaha in over 35 years, create the first black owned call center in North Omaha, North Omaha and expand the com commercial property at the Long School Marketplace. Currently, he is the president of the Omaha Economic Development Corporation, a nonprofit corporation whose goal is to transform the North Omaha community into a viable residential, economically successful and vibrant community that enables its residents to grow and live in a prosperous environment. Ms. Moroni is married to Dr. Barbara Hewins Moroni, and they are the proud parents of two daughters. At the time of the Omaha 54 arrest, Mr. Moroni was a 21 year old advanced student. So I would like to welcome all of our Omaha 54 panelists.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. So we're going to get started with uh, a few questions, and then we'll just go from there because I'm, I'm sure we'll more than it, we have more than enough conversation to take up the time. <laughs> and if anyone has any <laughs> questions, please feel free to put them in a chat, and we'll get them get to them uh, just as soon as we're able. So the first question that I have, and and each of you can can chime in as you as you please. Uh, what was your educational experience like before coming to UNO? And how different did you find the environment at UNO? So I know some of you uh, attended, or most of you attended uh, predominantly black uh, high schools, some all the way from elementary school. How different was that experience coming to UNO? Uh, I'll go ahead and start, uh, Deborah. Thank you again for the invitation. I'm certainly glad to be a part of this panel. And I'm certainly excited to be uh, a part of this conversation. Uh, as I had shared with some of us at another time, um, I come from an era where as a little black girl, I couldn't go to my local community school. And so I, I grew up predominantly in, uh, that was in St. Louis, Missouri, and then moving on to Chicago, Illinois, and uh, both experiences um, immersed me in having uh, teachers that encouraged me and supported me and all that I wish to do. And then from that time, I always wanted to be an educator. I always wanted to be a teacher. And then um, my father, eventually uh, we, we got moved to Omaha, Nebraska through his job. And that's how I ended up at UNO. And uh, UNO was, uh, different for me because I, I think there I think we had about 200 full-time black students at that time and I think I think uh, in immersed in uh, like 6,000 black 6,000 students in general and so a lot of the activities that we were involved in uh, you found yourself being the only one so when I, I decided to join the dance troupe I was the I think I was the actually the very first black girl that ever uh, joined the dance troupe. Eventually I became the president of Orcasis. Uh, certainly uh, built a lot of friendships around that, uh, but you, you kind of became the first. And uh, when I decided to go to become a part of this uh, beauty contest, again, I was the only black girl that was part of this beauty contest that UNO held. And I didn't expect to win, but at the same time I thought, we needed to be represented in that contest. So I, I guess the experience is for me that I found myself being uh, first in, uh, in uh, a lot of the activities that I got involved in, except for BLAC, Black, Black Liberators for Action on Campus, <laughs> which was a place I found to be mo all of us, mostly us. Okay, when I had the, the hello to everyone again, and thank you, Dr. Hurd. Um, I had just graduated in uh, 69 um, in May and then started school again in that August. And the thing that I found different from going to Lothrop and Horseman, and Horseman was where you had to go to different classes, and then North High where you had the different classes. But here at college, you had to discipline your own self. Uh, you had to be a self-starter if you wanted to succeed. You had to make sure you got the class on time, that you took your own notes. At that time, everything had to be typewritten. You had to wait to get into one of the rooms to be able to type your lessons if you did not have that at home. Uh, every aspect of, of your learning was in your own hands. And there was no one who forced you to complete your assignment. The environment was different in the fact that the classes from being in the regular school was it was like lectures. You came in, you sat down, your teacher told you, or your professor gave you what he was talking about. You had to fill it in to your notes to be able to do like that. And you had to be able to be a self-starter in order to succeed. So my environment coming from high school right into this was a whole lot different, but because I did have people in the background that kind of gave me pointers, 
we was able to succeed. Unfortunately, I did drop out shortly after we had our uh, students sit in uh, for the career that I was trying to pursue. Now, now Mr. Wibbs, go ahead and elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> If you could tell them why 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 you dropped out, it wasn't you had a real valid reason for dropping out. When I had come here doing and when we started in um, junior high, they had what was called the trades, and they had metal, uh, architecture, electricity, and carpentry. And I fell in love with carpentry. And as we progressed, and I went through a North High. I took up woodworking, it was called woodworking at that time. I wanted to be a carpenter. And so I came to UNO and at that time, it was called carpentry engineering. And so that's what I was coming to. And one day we was in the biology class, I had to take all these electives and I was in the biology class and just generally talking to different ones. And one of the white students asked me when we was telling what was going on and he said, Lavelle, he said, why are you going to a four-year college, taking all these unnecessary classes when you could go to a community college or join the Carpenters Union? And I had, even though people knew what I wanted to do, I had no one who had given me that direction and not knowing myself to branch out and to look. So that's how I ended up at UNO and plus, uh, I left home two weeks after I graduated because there was nine siblings. I'm number four. And so all of the costs and everything was on me and we were struggling to pay that. So once I found out that information that I left and ended up being a, a carpenter. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in uh, traveled somewhat up to a degree, the same road uh, that uh, Reverend Williams did. I went to Lothrop also, and I went to Horse Man, but I'm a little ahead of uh, Reverend Williams. So uh, I went there, went through there first, uh, but I did not go to North. I went to Tech High School. And for many of you, you don't know what Tech High School was because it's been uh, not a high school for probably 30 years at least. Uh, but is what's now the uh, school administration's uh, building, TAC building, mm -hmm. uh, that was Tech High. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I went there from for my sophomore, junior, and senior year, and the whole time I thought it was predominantly African American uh, because we lived on the fourth floor. That was kind of our hangout, and that's where <laughs> all the black kids hung out. And I thought we were the majority, and it wasn't until years after I graduated that I found out. We were not the majority of that school. We were the <laughs> minority. We just seemed like the majority. Uh, particularly when it came to all the athletic sports, we dominated, uh, yes. you know, all, all those. But anyway, uh, upon graduating and going to UNO, uh, it was kind of a cultural shock uh, when you go from, as Karen uh, said, from uh, uh, to 200, or well, you only have 200 roughly 200 black students out of about 6,000 students, uh, you kind of realize uh, you're in a different environment. Uh, and it did not take me long to realize that in that environment, uh, there was a different attitude. Uh, and you either adjusted uh, or you got lost in it. And that was part of why I think some of the things happened later on. And I'll stop there. <laughs> well, I... Um... I kind of took a little different journey path than everyone else. And I want to first thank um, Ms. Hurd for inviting me to participate. I've been enjoying myself and to talk to other people that went through some of the same experiences I went through is heartwarming and um, really takes me back on a, on a journey that I had at times forgotten about. So thank you so much, Deborah, for doing that for me. Um, I want to say that I started at um, Lake School, and um, I started there because we had moved into this house that uh, my parents had rented and um, on Ohio Street, 
and I started there and we had some kind of a drill where I guess we were looking for a Cold War drill. We thought we could go to war anytime again. And so there was outside of that building, anybody knows anything about Lake School, they know that it was a tall building and it had a really a silo hooked on it. But one day the teacher said, okay, everybody up. I was in uh, probably kindergarten. Everybody up, we've got to get in line and we're getting ready to go. And I thought, go where? I just got here. And it was my first week of school and we got, in a line and some teachers had pillows, some didn't, but we went down a chute. And when we got out of that chute, I went home and I told my mother, I don't think I wanna go back to that school. Now I was close to that school. She said, well, you know, if you don't go to that school, there's another school, Kellum School, and uh, you can go, we send you there, but um, you gotta have to walk, you have to do some walking. And so even in the snow, I walked to Kellum School because I didn't want to go back down that chute. But while at <laughs> Kellum School, I discovered a lot of friends and um, some of the teachers didn't seem like they, they knew much about me. I was a little bit different, but I thought I was different because I was black, but I just think I was just different. <laughs> and so um, once getting into the sixth grade, I ran into a lady who was, um, her, her name was Catherine Fletcher. And when I went home and told my mother about Catherine Fletcher, she said, well, that's your cousin. You better behave yourself. And uh, by then I couldn't wait to get out of that school because I had a hard time behaving myself <laughs> in school. I, have to tell you that. I did a lot of things. And I ended up next, next time I went to Tech High, Junior High. And um, that was a kind of a nice experience because we had all kinds of things that things I was interested in like the arts. And when I got to high school, I was excited. I went into the choir, but my mother said, no, you're gonna to go to Central High. You're gonna go where your sister went. She went to Central. So I thought, okay, I don't think they wanna go there, but I, I was interested in drama and acting and being in plays. I love that. And I said, okay, as long as I can be in a play. Well, about the third week at Central, they had a casting call and my name came up in that casting call. I was shocked. But when I got to, I won't say the name of the play. I won't say who was involved. But they needed a maid, somebody to play a maid, just to walk on, no talking. And I thought, mm, this isn't the school for me. So I got my backpack, left my books, and I walked to Tech High School. And then I told my parents in about a week that I, didn't, I wasn't attending. Central High, I was at Tech High School. And so then I was in a lot of plays, a lot of good plays. I remember Mr. Roy, I don't know if anybody who went to Tech remembers Mr. Roy. He was in charge of the acting. And so I got involved with acting and I just, I just really loved it. And so because of that, because of the arts, my grades started to improve and go up, up, up. And so by the time I got to my senior year, or a little before my senior year, I was sent to Creighton University. So I attended Creighton University for a while my, my first year. My mother was, became ill. And so I, we had discovered we were gonna have to pay money after that. And I was going to become a medical student. So I knew I couldn't afford that. So I, for some reason, got a scholarship to do Shan. So I crossed over and went, I said, I'm gonna go where? Uh, well, you got a scholarship now and you gotta go where the money is. So I went to do Shan, kind of a strange journey. And at do Shan, I learned uh, how to behave. I learned regimentality. I learned how to sit in a row. I learned how to listen. I learned how to show a lot more respect than I was showing even at home. So um, I felt like that was a journey. I, di I didn't mind it because uh, it challenged me scholastically. I learned I wasn't the smartest one in the room and uh, I really had to study. I learned, I, girl, you got to study now. And when I got into my first year, I was excited, but the school closed down. I said, is this because of me? Are you closing the school? Because there were very many black kids at this school. And so they moved the school to Chicago. And they said, no, this is just going to be an elementary and a high school now. So I couldn't, I didn't want to leave my mom and go to Chicago because I felt like she needed me and I worked 
at the time I was working as a model and I was singing. Uh, a lot of people didn't know this, but I was singing in some clubs to make money to help pay for some things around the house because we didn't have much money. And from there, then I went to UNO. And um, I, I didn't have a problem with academics. I didn't have a problem with knowing where to go and when to go because I had already gone through all of that. But what I had a problem with something that I had not known at Duchenne was the caring side of it. Because the nuns took, took you aside and they would talk to you. They let me stay in the dorm when they knew I had trouble getting back and forth to work. They would give me rides places that I needed to go. So I had a community. When I got to UNO, there was no community. That was the thing that was a challenge, but fortunately I have one at home. So that what was different about UNO, I did not see community. Um, I did not see people who really cared whether you succeeded or not. And those were the things that I had to get from my church from my pastor, from my home, and from my community at large. So let me follow up uh, on that with, with the rest of y'all. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Pope. Um, so, you know, from your various communities that you grew up in, what was your perception of UNO, uh, you know, before getting there? What did you expect to face and do you think that you were actually prepared for what you, what you did face while you were on campus? And I'm thinking about uh, you know, interactions maybe with faculty members or with other students, because uh, we didn't talk about you know, how you were treated in class, but you can kind of talk about that as well. I expected the teachers to be more helpful, but I soon realized that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, I also expected that being a college, being students, that you would make friends rather quickly. That also didn't happen. And I found out that I wasn't prepared for the, uh, I'll call it the process of actually beginning school and acquiring the books. Because like I said, I just come, I really didn't, I had some people who had helped and gave me some instructions on what college would be like. But when you actually got here on campus and you begin to interact and try to go to school, the acquiring of the books, you go to class and they say, well, you don't have this. Well, you know, where do I get that? Go to the bookstore. Found out when you got to the bookstore uh, and I was able to see this, they had books. But when you would say, I need to get this book, well, those have been set aside. And the ones that were tore had pages missing. Well, you can get those over there. And you know, you were able to take them and look at them. And so I found out the teachers that I had, the professors that I had, they let you know straight up, we're not babysitters, you know. And I even had a couple of them in there, actually, when I said they call them lectures. They told you, we don't care if you pass or not. You're on your own. You're here to get. We give you the information. It's up to you to follow and to go with it and do that. They gave you their syllabus, and there you were. There were very few, except a couple, that would take time when you would go afterwards and ask the question that would give you a question. Most of them would just refer you to go and to look it up. That was the terminology, go and look it up and find it out on your own. So my expectations that I had coming was that it was a unity, a community that would embrace me, that would help me to learn, that would be concerned about my future. And I did not find that. And again, all the teachers that I had when I was here for the classes that I had, they were the white or Asian, there were no black faces in those, any of the classes that I took. So that was the experience that I had that when I came here, it was, it was quite different from what I was expecting. I was just looking, oh, they're gonna embrace me and I'm gonna be part of this. Even with getting with the other students, 
The only time you saw black, I saw black students was when we went over to um, Maya Bell Student Center where you were waiting to get into the classes to use the typewriters. Um, I, Deborah, I, I'd say that, I don't know, I always look to create, I guess, my community in some respects, because I found um, some, some friends where we decided to, to join a sorority. And so that started building friendships that way. Um, the difficulties were the fact that sometimes it was difficult to, to find space to meet. So we had to meet at homes because uh, back during that time, it was hard to find faculty sponsors for some of the activities we wanted to be a part of. And so it, if you didn't have a faculty sponsor, it was it's hard to find places to meet. And so this was the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. So it was an, uh, it was an African-American sorority. So we, we built friendships that way. And then um, basically, you know, it's, it's about, I guess, being courageous, uh, just kind of trying to find those areas where, you know, you might step into something that you might not feel as comfortable in, but you have to kind of create that community. And that's what I found myself doing. Um, I, because I was a good student, I was on the Dean's list at, in the College of Education. So being on the Dean's list, that's a whole nother, another group of people that I would be with. Again, I'd be the only black person perhaps, but our, our Dean at that time, we actually would meet at his home. So I got a chance to really know that the Dean of the college through being on the Dean's list. And, and he listened to some of my concerns and some of the students' concerns. Um, and then um, there was a class I took and I can't remember the name of it, it but Eugene Freund taught it, but it was something, of, it was something like uh, culture Omaha or whatever. But based on that class, we studied the various cultures around Omaha and we actually went and had class for, for example, at the Jewish synagogue. So we went to, again, I'm, I'm, usually I'm the only black girl in, this, in these scenarios, but the, I was building communities in that respect. You know, to kind of point out uh, a little more in terms of what Karen was just saying, uh, there were no black organizations recognized on campus because there were no black uh, uh, faculty to uh, sponsor them, uh, and which is one one of the demands that we 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 we, we addressed uh, uh, in our protests. Uh, I, I would say, and I think it, it's been said, there were a few. Uh, instructors, professors who actually, I think, reached out and tried to uh, be of help. Uh, there are three that come to my mind whose names I have not forgotten. And had it not been for them, I might have had a greater struggle than I, you know, uh, than I did have. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge: there were no African American uh, faculty. Uh, there, there was one or two black employees, uh, but there was a lot of apprehension even within them in terms of reaching out to help because, you know, back in those days, you could lose your job if you went too far, uh, you know. So that was, uh, you know, a big struggle we had. Um, I was in speech and language pathology and audiology and I majored in science. Um, there were only three of us in that particular program. One graduated before me, so there were two of us. One of them lives and resides in San Diego, Jerry Brown. I don't know if any of you remember her. Um, I asked her to, well, she contacted me. She was working in um, Denver and she, said that she didn't like the environment. I said, well, there's only one of me out here. So come out here, I need a friend. So that's how we both got, <laughs> she came out to San Diego to be with me. But I, um, I was not surprised at all. And I did not have great expectations. I was dissuaded from the program speech and language pathology by the people of the department, two of which ended up moving out to San Diego and they were shocked to see me running one of the departments that they had to face. Turnabout's fair play. So I 
it's, it's even kind of difficult to talk about because it was a stressful, stressful time. I was determined not to waste anybody's money, especially my family's money when it came to school. And so I studied hard, but there were a lot of study groups, which I was not made aware of. There were tests being passed around, which I was not made aware of. So if I didn't get a very good score, I always thought it was me. And I want people listening to know it's not always you, especially if you worked hard. And so, but I, I never was a quitter and I wouldn't give up if for no other reason but to uh, make, that, make other people happy. So I began to form some of my own study groups, a group of one, and I began to cook and have food. I'm a good cook. And when I would have food, I would invite some of the white girls because there's mainly women in this program. And some of them couldn't resist but to come. I had one, one friend. And when it came time for me to take my audiology final, which was very difficult, we had to do a hands-on uh, project. And then we had to do uh, orals and written. So there was, there was a lot involved in, in the degree. And um, when I did my project, there was this one white girl and she says, you know, I'm real good friends with, I won't say who the professor is, the head of the department at the time. And it, we're very good friends. And um, I know I can help you, let's be partners. And we became partners. And so I accelerated. And when I got out of that, by the time I got out of the program, I was at that point, had just ended my term as Miss Omaha. And so the school, was not really very friendly because they didn't like that kind of publicity and neither was Omaha Public Schools. So I did not try to even get hired at Omaha Public Schools because of the racism. I went ahead and I got hired at Bellevue Public Schools and I also worked at Offutt of Air Force Base as an audiologist. So I had other avenues. And when I decided I wanted to further my career, that's when I left Omaha. All right, so uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so some of you were involved in Black, so as you go around, you can talk about your, your involvement in, in Black, but uh, how aware were you of the student movements that were happening at other universities around the country because, and, and their demands, because your demands that you made at the administration uh, parallels a lot of the demands that are being made at other universities around the country. So how aware were you of the things that were going on at other schools? Deborah, I'm, I think personally I was aware, but I was more aware of what was happening in the community. And if you, know, if you think about the Omaha community, uh, there, were, there had been some uh, rioting and race concerns uh, with that in the community. And then in Chicago, I also saw uh, the various uh, different race riots that were happening uh, in the community. And so, uh, you know, there was kind of like that righteous anger kind of happening. And, and you think about just the fact that, um, just the time, the time that that was, you know, we had Malcolm X was killed in 65 and Kennedy in 69, and then the Vietnam War was going on, and Martin Luther King was killed in 68. And so there was just a lot of uh, unrest, period, certainly across universities, but also across the country and across our own city. So just that awareness, you know, you just kind of had that uh, righteous anger. I mean, you just, and you felt like if you saw something that was wrong, you wanted, you wanted to kind of right that wrong. You kind of, morally had to say something you know you had to again uh being courageous is not is it's not popular but it's it's about purpose and so uh when you want to live in a better society and you want to live in a better school you want to be in a better environment you've got to stand up and do something and so th that's kind of more where i was in reference to knowing that um you know i had i had to i had to stand up for what i believed in and um, I know you haven't really asked about some of the, some of the uh, actions that uh, Black Liberators for Action on Campus wanted, but we were finding that we weren't being treated fairly. 
uh, activities that we want to, wanted to be involved in. Uh, we couldn't find uh, places to host them. And of course, um, eventually we, we were gonna try to have, we were trying to work with the student center and the student center director uh, was not very kind to us. They did not uh, treat us like other students. They made us pay for security and different things uh, that other, other student organizations didn't have to do. And so we, you know, I think we just, it was just kind of like a, we were kind of like boiling, you know, it was like boiling and boiling and eventually it erupted. And what I said is that uh, we were like, a, like pebbles in a pond and, and we caused a ripple effect. But I also th th thought about that um, we became a drop in the river that eventually broke the dam. And when that dam broke, that's when uh, a lot of things started happening and a lot of changes took place at the university. So um, I, I know you just specifically asked about what was happening at other universities, but it was just, it was across the country, across the board. Well, my, um, my brother-in-laws, uh, William Moore and Al Goodwin, were affiliated with the Wesley House and other people, Rodney Wee, Charlie Washington, they would come to my, one of my brother-in-law's houses, whoever was hosting and have a separate meeting, but they would sit back and I would kind of listen and they would talk about some of the activities that were happening. And some of those were happening on campuses like um, Hampton University, where they suspended and walked out of classes because of, of uh, school, ROTC and other things, Washington University. They demand, had a lot of demands that they were doing Cornell and Harvard University with their black students. They were protesting. Um, the, I, I really uh, thought a lot about Hampton University because it was also written up in the Omaha Star in Virginia and they were suspending classes um, for sometimes weeks and uh, George Washington University also suspending classes for uh, long periods of time. Uh, they would occupy the Soviet Institute um, building there. At Queensboro College in New York, they were protesting and black students were protesting. So Grinnell College, all over the United States, they were very active and, and protesting. So they would talk about strategize. Well, I wonder what, what they're gonna do at UNO because they could hear the heat and they knew things were happening there. I was somewhat involved, I have to be very honest. I was more involved when it came to the last organization. I was not involved with SCOPE, but when they formed the new organization, I began to go to meetings and participate. I was asked to participate and I wanted to participate. Um, but other people were pulling me the other way and they did not want me to participate. Um, at UNO, uh, they had discovered in uh, one of the bathrooms in student union that there was a noose that had been cut down and um, that was directed at me to tell me to stay out of all of these things because I was um, really embarrassing Omaha. And so uh, I talked to my family and made up my mind. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to be as active as I could because I was on a journey and couldn't turn around. So, and Dr. Right. Polk, this was while you were Miss Omaha, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my experience didn't begin with uh, uh, the 54. Uh, in fact, two years before then, uh, I had. Uh, founded and on campus and co-chaired uh, the forerunner to BLAC, which was the African American Council for Action. Uh, it, was a, it was an attempt to bring black students together. Uh, we couldn't meet on campus, so we would meet uh, at the Girls' Y when it was on 20th in Miami. Uh, it's no longer there now though, but, uh, uh, and, and we had to, and, and even though we were meeting off campus, we did have an advisor, but the advisor was a teacher at North High School uh, who's helped guiding us. But anyway, uh, the African American Council for Action, uh, in December of 67, we actually held a, what we called a stand-in. Uh, and then the uh, Dean of the History Department, uh, Dr. Stanley Trickett, some things you don't forget. Uh, and it, we were protesting the lack of a black history course. Uh, 
and it made the in fact that picture you showed of me that was that, that was at that uh, at that particular protest and one of the realities that set in to me would kind of help guide me when the when when the 54 uh, uh, evolved uh, was that what they did was the the history department the dean they sent a white professor back east during the summer of 68 uh, to take some refresher courses in Black Studies and came back that next year and taught a course in Black Studies. Uh, <laughs> well, that was a slap in the face as far as many yes. of us were concerned. Uh, but uh, we were aware that there were some issues and problems, not only on the UNO campus, but around the, around the country. All right, so, um, and, and, and I know Dr. Hayes Harris has an interesting story about uh, her, her involvement um, <laughs> with her parents. Oh, so yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I kind of open it up for you to kind of talk about, uh, because and I, and I mentioned this, you know, being involved in in movements like this, especially when uh, whether you're first generation college student or not, your parents or your family, they're really looking looking to you to be that next generation to move the family forward. And you do that through education. You got to get that degree or or whatever. And so becoming involved for some students was a risky proposition at home. I mean, you, you, you big and bad when you're on campus, but you got to get go home and face uh, somebody, your mom or a grandma, somebody is just like, you know, you, you better not get kicked out of school. So uh, what were some of the issues you may have had to negotiate either at home or in the community uh, in, in your involvement on campus? In reference to that story, Deborah, um, I, I worked two jobs to go to school and uh, I, I served as a waitress. And I, I remember uh, every night coming home with my pockets fill, filled with tips and pouring them out. And everybody in the family helped me count my tips. And that was a big deal. And then I also taught dance uh, in the community. It, it was... Um, uh, actually a community center over in South Omaha, but basically uh, with a lower income African-American uh, children. And so I was working two jobs. So my parents pretty much thought that, okay, when I left school, I was gonna be at one of the jobs. It's kind of hard to, for them to keep up with which job I was at, but they were watching the news that night. And all of a sudden they looked up and they saw me walk, walking on the news, walking past the screen with my hand up like black power. And they said, well, we guess Karen didn't go to, she didn't go to work tonight. <laughs> we better go down and see if uh, we need to try to get her out. But in reference to, you know, I mean, actually getting uh, arrested and mugshot and fingerprinted and all that, um, I actually went through probation for a year so that I could get mm. it off my record. So I had to meet with my probation offer, officer every week for a whole year to get that off my record. My uh, thing dealing with family like that, is kind of interesting too, because uh, my mom was celebrating my grandfather's uh, birthday and she had talked to us months before about nobody being late, everybody be there at five o'clock. And so when we were arrested that day, I called my sister and told her I'm not gonna make it. And she said, you know what's gonna happen? One of my friends also, she told me, she said, uh, Lavelle, you know your mama gonna whoop you if you get arrested. Because uh, Michael had told us before, he said, and uh, I give my props to him because being a young man as he was when I come there, uh, he was very articulate and telling us who were just coming in how to behave ourselves. And he said, when we go into here, he said, we're not going in cursing, we're not going in be disrespectful. He said, we're gonna go in. He said, we're gonna be in order. He said, if you go, you're probably gonna get arrested. 
And I would say that probably 65%, if not more, of the Black students who were there left when we went over uh, to um, the office. And the thing of it was that when we did go in there, and Brandon May told me, said, Mama was just, where is little bit? Blah, 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 blah. And Daddy said, well, uh, Dorothy, he said, let's watch the news. And it just so happened, <laughs> I was one of those of that picture that you showed, Professor Heard, that company said, hey, that's your son right there. And uh, so then when I got home, uh, as I said, I was uh, living away from home, but then when I got a chance to see them, and she asked me, what was you doing in that? You know, you struggling, you paying for this yourself, you could have lost everything. But yet and still, my father and others, and even my mom were supportive. But at that time, we had the community who was behind us that did encourage us. And I made me well, but those, my involvement after that was kind of more because I did get married, was more with community things. When we had our churches, the Ministerial Alliance, and some of the people I had just, uh, Senator Danner, uh, you mentioned um, Charles Washington, Pastor Wade, Pastor Streeter, Ernie Chambers before he became the senator, Miss Brown, Miss Bertha Meyer. She was one of my main persons who helped me starting at Horseman. Uh, Miss Callaway, Paul Allen, if you know, uh, who had the nightclub there. Uh, both the Preston Love, the senior and the junior. And these were people that encouraged us. And I interacted somewhat with because they knew of my family. And so my involvement afterwards in activism was mostly through the church because those people were involved in stuff and they would rally the church members and I would be a part of that. So. Well, I'm still fighting the battle. What did you say? I'm still fighting the battle. People ask me all the time when I'm gonna retire. <laughs> and, and, and I always tell them when I can when I can figure out what I do with, with the rest of my life once I do. Okay. <laughs> now that's a good answer. <laughs> and you know, and I, I think that's so true of you, uh, Michael Maroney, in reference to uh, your involvement with the community. And and I, I just think about uh, my involvement by staying involved with UNO. I always stay connected to UNO, even when I was with Omaha Public Schools, I was on something called OPS UNO Liaison Committee. I always kept that connection with UNO and, and I knew that eventually I was gonna to get to UNO um, to actually work. And so when that opportunity came, um, I, I, I really got uh, heavily involved in all aspects of, of mentoring young people, especially young people of color. So, uh, you know, we had a hard time when I was coming up trying to find somebody to serve as their faculty representative, but I took it upon myself to make sure that whatever they needed help with, with uh, any of the um, multicultural activities or um, black studies or any activities like that, that where I could make a difference, uh, be a, uh, an ear, help to support young people in reference to their leadership. Uh, I served as a mentor for the Goodrich program. I served as a mentor for um, just whatever, whatever activity came up. And then I also chaired the Chancellor's Commission for Multicultural Education. So uh, it's, it's always been uh, important to me to stay involved in that work because the work must continue the, and the work has to continue because we still have the levels, many of the same concerns in some respects. I, I want to oh, add that I really followed in the path of my family. They were very strong activists from the early 1900s and into like what well, I talked earlier about my grandfather, Dr. D.W. Gooden, and he made changes to uh, hospitals and to nursing in the Omaha area. And my mother, who was very active and they used to call her an activist but they also called her uh, a person who made a lot of trouble especially at um, meetings for Omaha Public Schools. As a matter of fact they changed the format for meetings at Omaha 
public schools because she refused to sit down when she was addressing the needs of black children and at a meeting, school board meeting. And so that next week after she did this for three or four months, they decided that they were going to have a time limit and uh, those who could stand up and express themselves. And so whenever she went anywhere, um, I was dragged along. She was in a protest against the Omaha World Herald for their writings and how they portrayed blacks, especially black men in newspaper stories. And so there's a picture of her in the World Herald outside protesting with uh, a lot of the ministers and other activists in the city. So I followed, kind of followed that path and that journey. Um, she said, whatever you have, you didn't get it yourself. You didn't get it on your own. You got it on the backs of somebody else. And so when I would start something, I was determined to finish it, um, including that contest I was in because um, there was also a noose in our backyard that was hanging. Rocks came through our windows. I still have the letters of threats and things. I kept those. And I have a wonderful letter from uh, Warren Buffett's wife, Susie Buffett, who, who expressed concern for my safety and, um, and my family's safety. We had black businessmen who came to the house telling me to get out of that contest, telling my parents to get me out. And we had um, white people saying I was going to ruin my life. And um, I didn't worry about uh, having a, a record or anything like that because I already had a record. I had been in four or five protests before that where I had been locked up. So I, um, I just knew that my, that things had to happen. And my only problem was how were we gonna keep it going? How was our race going to, to keep things moving and, and at least keep what we have and not turn, turn the backs and turn away? So um, I, when I left Omaha, I continued on that journey and um, did a lot of things as far as activities. And uh, I received honors for those things, but the biggest honor is to know that um, whatever my life journey, that I did my best. So, um, Mr. Maroney, I wanted to ask you some questions about uh, your activism on, on campus, because uh, you talked about forming the, the forerunner to Black. And I mean, what I want the audience to know, and that's the reason why I asked, you know, how old you were when you were arrested, because you all were teenagers. Mm -hmm. You know, you were very young people doing this work. And uh, so, Ms. Maroney, you helped to found this organization that pulled together the black students on campus and then you know created uh, a list of demands that ended up before the president of the university so i wanted to ask you if you could talk about you know what it took to organize the students and to to come up with a you know clean list of demands and mr williams already talked about the fact that you instructed them when they went in for the uh, sit-in, you know, how to act. So can you just give us a little bit of, of uh, information about that? Because I think that's really important for the students who might watch this to know what it is to organize at this level. It, it's, let me go back to 1967, when we when, when formed what was called the Afro-American Council for Action. Uh, and to be honest with you, when I was talking to uh, uh, other black students at that time, there was a lot of resistance to forming a, uh, an organization uh, for a lot of different reasons. And it just so happens that I was friends with a number of gentlemen, uh, students who uh, came out of the East Coast, uh, they called the Jersey Boys. Uh, mm -hmm. and they were really much more familiar with the activism because coming out of New Jersey and the New York area, you know, they had been doing, they had been active, you know, uh, a long time. And in talking to them, uh, they kind of agreed with me and felt, especially since they had been Nebraska very long and they saw the, the, the difference in attitude and the way people were treated. Uh, they uh, agreed. To, 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 in fact, I, I'm not sure if, uh, people on the on, on your audience 
would remember a guy by the name of uh, uh, Harold Dow, who was a uh, uh, one of the first black uh, TV newscasters on 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 the local station here. Well, his brother uh, Harold, I mean Jimmy Dow, and I were the co-chairs of that organization. Once these guys got on board, uh, it it was kind of like a magnet for uh, others. They said, that, you know, these guys coming out of the East Coast, you know, think this is important, you know. So uh, we were actually, we, we, we wound up with quite a few uh, students that uh, were part of the uh, 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 the movement that we, we, we created um, and which led to that stand in in 67. Uh, which was that forerunner to the city in in, 50, in, in uh, 69. Uh, when it comes to 69, because uh, between the, the, that year of 68, 69, uh, fall of 68 through the spring of 69, I was not in school. When I came back, and that was the year uh, they evolved into BLAC, changed the name. And when I came back in September of, of, of 69, I was not uh, a member of the BLAC, and, and, and I know that Karen and, and Kathy were uh, a part of that, and they might do a better job of describing what happened with the dance that failed that really led to people getting upset and uh, forming that movement uh, to do that uh, request for demands in, in, in the ultimate city. Can you talk about though, because you were saying that uh, that that newspaper article was talking about the the lack of uh, black history courses. So can you talk about, I mean, because you had to have been able to, there had to be some kind of sentiment among the students that they, that they needed some kind of faculty representation and that, and that the education needed to reflect their history and culture as well. So well, can yeah, you even, talk about yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, even in 67, uh, uh, we were having a lot of difficulty because where, where the Blacks hung out was in the student center. And uh, there was a very uh, negative uh, feeling about the, the those people who were the employees of the student center were very negative toward Black students. Uh, you know, just in the way they talked to them, the way they treated them, uh, and and I think that there was there was an incident that happened to some black students at that student center that really got them motivated to say we got to do something different because it was obvious that we were being treated uh, in less than a humane way uh, by these employees of the of, of, of the university. Dr. Harris, were you about to say something? No, I was agreeing with Michael because uh, basically black students were experiencing just actual anguish. Um, you know, we were trying to do some positive things. We were, we were trying to have positive activities and we're, I mean, we weren't doing anything negative, but yet we were treated as if we were trying to do something that was wrong. But yet we saw other activities that were happening, uh, students organizing and doing things and having, uh, social activities and they were able to do what they could do. And then we would, with the dance, basically uh, we were, they were supposed to supply us with a, uh, I guess at that time it might've been a record player, but uh, they just didn't supply us with, with what they said they were gonna supply us with. So we had a music a mu musicless dance. There was a dance with no music. And that was only based on the fact that people who were supposed to support us and help us didn't come through. They also had us actually um, paying for uh, security, like they just automatically assumed there was going to be problems. And then they also had us paying for the, the tickets. And uh, other, other groups, they were able to have free security and got free tickets. And, you know, so we, we just saw that there was some inequities. And so uh, we, you know, it just started again, just piling up and piling up. And so we just wanted to talk to the chancellor. But, you know, when we went in to talk to him, that, that was our goal. And in fact, a year before that, UNL had had a set in 
And they were able to solve their concerns because their chancellor talked to the students. He didn't call the police on them. And uh, uh, Naylor did not talk to us at all. He didn't, he didn't want to, you know, he, in fact, um, you know, we, ga we gave him a chance to actually be able to, to maybe talk to other faculty or other individuals and maybe come up with a, a plan. And I think we were willing to work with him towards a plan, uh, but um, that he just, you know, call the police. Essentially, we were dismissed at that meeting. Uh, yeah. uh, he, he really did not want to discuss it. But but let me kind of back up on the, the uh, Karen was right that the black students got really upset by the way they were treated uh, at, that, at that dance that failed because of the uh, uh, lack of responsiveness on the part of the, 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 the student uh, the employees that were uh, in charge. And uh, so some of us felt there was an opportunity not only to protest a dance, but to really look at more serious structural things uh, that, that, that were wrong with the university. And, and actually from the time of the dance, which was in September, I believe, Karen, mm -hmm. or, or Karen, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we actually did the protest, it was a couple months, and we were meeting, some of us were meeting on a weekly basis, trying to formulate uh, how we were going to respond uh, and take advantage of this opportunity where uh, students were motivated to move and do some things. Mm -hmm. Well, we, when we saw the way things were going, and um, what we wanted was a voice and a seat at the table, when it came to our concerns and that wasn't happening. But when we finally did get a chance to push forward the concerns, some of them were uh, to address the student uh, employees at the student center. That was one big one. And with Ray and um, the, who was the director of activities, we wanted his resignation. Um, we wanted to benefit the athletes and make sure they had special uh, training equipment, training tables, along with health, with their uh, help with their uh, health concerns and at meeting their academic needs, uh, meeting tutors and things like that to help them so they could be successful. We wanted the voice in finding select uh, and selecting, helping to select uh, teachers. We wanted to have teachers in special areas and we wanted uh, black teachers. We wanted teachers who would uh, be able to talk to the students and understand their needs. Um, so there were there were a lot of things. And of course, as Karen said, we wanted to also address the needs of that party, extracurricular activities. How were those things going to be handled? Who was going to be responsible for that? And we wanted to be in reimbursed of our money that we have put in there and lost because of the dance uh, that was ha uh, held at the student center. Um, so there were, there were just a lot of things and we wanted to see those changes made. And what I liked about who we were at the time, I never heard anyone talk about anything that addressed personal needs. It was all about the needs of the African-American students, how the school was going to approach us and meet our needs so that we could be successful and those coming behind us could be successful. It was organized. I know students came from Creighton because I had gone to Creighton. They, they supported us. When we walked out that door, we weren't by ourselves when, when we were arrested and walked out that door. I was one of three, one of the first three to go out that door. And I looked around me, I saw family members, I saw teachers, I saw white students, I saw um, uh, people from other schools there. and. Uh, and educators, and so, and that was in in the daytime. So they had to leave wherever they were in order to come and support us, or not go to classes and support us. So with that, taking that into account, we wanted to make things different. Um, did we expect the changes that we saw? I, I don't know. I don't know if we expected it to turn out the way it did, but we were going to hold them to the fire. And I. I, uh, you know, there's, there are, there's a lot of information in the archives of the library. And uh, so there's lots of information to pull, but at the same time, a lot, a lot of what we were talking about, other students supported it because other students also saw 
the inequities. And other students also saw that, for, that the individuals that we were having concern with were also probably maybe showing that some of that, that same level of disrespect to them. And then just the whole student voice, you know, at the universities, you feel like students need to have a voice, you know, and the, the avenue for students having a voice wasn't really there. And so some of our demands were beyond black students, they were all students. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I recall us walking through the hallways and how there are students on both sides of the hallways, black as well as white, standing in support of us knowing that we were going in, marching down to the chancellor's office to have a set in and they were lining the halls in support. Some of them had their hands up, you know, showing black power. And of course, you know, this was a pivotal year in reference to uh, being black and I'm proud. I mean, this was a, you know, this was, this was all part of the sixties, you know, understand, you know, there was a time uh, before that, you call somebody black, and they weren't very excited about it. But this is this is black power. You know, hairstyles was cha were changing, outfits were changing. I mean, I had my big fro, and when I was marching with my hand up, so you know, I mean, so this was all a part of being black, and I'm proud, and so we deserve to be treated with dignity, and we marched there with dignity, and we didn't show any. You know, we we did not shut down the university. We did not scream, curse, anything. We were very respectful. We just wanted to talk to the chancellor. And so, but we were not treated, we gave them respect, but we were not, we were not treated in the same level of respect that we gave. So there are a couple of questions in the chat uh, that I'm gonna read. So the first one is from Dr. Robinson, who's the, the chair of the Department of Black Studies. Um, she writes, did any of you expect that a Black Studies department would come from any of your protests? And are you surprised that the department has lasted 50 years? I don't like to speak first. I'm going to speak really briefly. Yes and yes. I, I, was, I am surprised that what came out of it, I think it was due to also the efforts of people throughout the city of Omaha, our Black leaders, our ministers, uh, our family members who supported us, businesses. I think all of that contributed to what led to the Black Studies Department. That it has lasted for 50 years. When I got the call saying, do you want to come to an anniversary? And it was from Vicki Parks, uh, who I love. And she said, do you, I said, what are you talking about? She says, well, you know, it's been 50 years. I said, <clears throat> is the department, it's still there? Yeah, that's right. It's, is it still up and running and vibrant? She said, girl, you got to come and see it for yourself. So I, I, I was just excited and elated and I'm, I'm so proud. So whenever they say, anybody asks me, where do you go to school? I speak a lot of places across the United States. They ask me, where'd you go to school? And I say, the University of Nebraska at Omaha, the only, one of the only universities that has a black studies program where you can still get a degree. So I'm just very proud of that. Yes, but I was very surprised, yes. I would say I agree with uh, Dr. Pope, yes and yes. Because when I found out about it, uh, it was my desire when I dropped out uh, that it would come about. I did not follow through with it. But then when I uh, heard about it. And again, she talked about Vicki. Uh, Vicki and my wife were very good because my wife was one of the very few Black librarians uh, for the city of Omaha. Uh -huh. And so they did a lot of things together. And uh, when we found out about it, and I said, what? And they said, yeah. And then when they mentioned, I said, well, I did not even know they considered us as promoting and being a part of something. So it was interesting in that it has continued. And even now, just listening sometimes and looking at the way our political status is going and some of the things since I've become aware of this that I follow, my concern is that there are avenues that seem to be trying to take away what has been gained. So mm -hmm. I told my wife, I would like to get more involved in making sure whatever part I can play that that doesn't happen. For me, 
That's why I want to see that statue in the front of you and all. Commemorating the Omaha 54. I don't want them to forget and I don't want them to take it away. All right. For me, uh, I, would, I, I was surprised. Uh, one, I would, some of us, a few of us became very skeptical uh, in the initiation of the Black Studies Department because of the way we realized how they did the Black course that we talked about and how diluted it was mm -hmm. uh, and felt that it was going to be ineffective. And then there were several attempts over the course of these 50 years mm -hmm. that the university attempted to get rid of the Black Studies Department mm -hmm. through either defunding or, 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 or incorporating them into a, 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 another college. And had it not been for the community raising up you know, and inviting, uh, it, that could have happened. Uh, but we were able to stay the course and the, the, the department is still there and kudos to uh, all those who are there now and carrying the ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, and I, you know, having stayed involved with the university through the years, I was able to see the, the difference that it made for us to do what we did. Because of course, um, the Indians were changed to the Mavericks. The Wampy Room was changed to the, <laughs> the uh, Maverick, uh, to the Milo Bell Student Center. And of course, you know, you mentioned all, uh, I think I, someone mentioned all the like black, black study, I think you did Deborah, black studies department, women's studies, Asian, Latina, all these studies, the multicultural office. I mean, having stayed involved because again, I stayed there for three degrees and then uh, still stayed a part of it for the um, UNO OPS liaison committee that I was on. So I kept seeing things happening. And so I knew that things were happening, uh, but I also stayed involved with the black studies uh, department. Uh, anything that they they needed me to do, I, I, I was part of for them, uh, having served on faculty senate, uh, vice president of faculty senate. I was very immersed and involved. Um, the African American organization, I served as a faculty advisor. So I just stayed involved. Um, but I know that, uh, that they have had their struggle. Uh, mm -hmm. I was very involved when George Garrison was, was the chair of the department. But um, I know they've had their struggle, and so I wanted to always be a part of supporting their efforts. And uh, we certainly appreciate uh, Cynthia now as she continues to, you know, I'm, I mean, there are still times when they're forgotten. So we got to make sure that that the Black Studies Department is never forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Maroney and I had the chance. I was a professor at uh, UNO when you celebrated your 25th anniversary, Black Studies did. And um, Michael Maroney and I was the spokespersons for that uh, event. And my son and his church reenacted the dance. And it was a beautiful play that they gave, but they reenacted the dance so that all the students could see really what happened and how they were mistreated and what actually was the straw that broke the camel's back, because that was really just you know, it's like the last straw, you know, it's, it's not, it's not that the dance was that important, but yes, it was based on all the other issues that we were facing. And so, um, again, uh, uh, I had that opportunity to, to represent Omaha 54 at, at 25 years, uh, Michael Maroney and I did. And so I will always be there for Omaha 54. I, I have um, three of my children who came through UNO. UNO is it's, it's my lifeblood. It's the place where I grew up. It's the place that I'll always continue to be at. And, and now that I'm Professor Emeritus, I have a lifelong appointment. So I will always be a UNO um, student or faculty person and whatever I, you need me to be, I'll be there for you. All right, thank you all so much for that. Um, so the other question is from Dr. Jody Nethery Castro. In the scrapbook of materials in our library, I was surprised to see a number of letters of support for President Naylor standing strong against Black students by calling the police at the sit-in, but also from institutional leaders from Creighton University and even OPPD. How did that lack of support for the students make you feel, and did it affect the climate at UNO at the time? Did you feel you had enough support to make you feel safe or supported? 
for me, it reinforced what we 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 were all about. Uh, it just brought <laughs> yeah. out the racism uh, mm -hmm. that was prevalent at that time, and as far as I'm concerned, still exists. Uh, so I wasn't surprised. There, there was a lot of support. There was a lot of support for us too. So I, I, the, there was a human relations committee uh, of faculty during that time who were to in total support of what we did. And I think about how the NAACP was so involved and totally in support of what we did. So we had that community support as well as inner college support or inner university support that kind of, for me, kind of counterbalanced the other because I think all of us as uh, Black folk have had people that were not supportive. That doesn't stop us. That just gives us fire to keep moving on and pushing on. I found the support um, after that through the churches. Uh, as I say, there was the uh, ministry alliance and uh, being knowledgeable with many of the uh, pastors who were the community leaders, we had that support. Um, and so I was happy, even though I ended up dropping out of college, I was happy that they were supporting the students in that effort to go forth and to acquire something that was needful, not just for, and it was said earlier, as us ourselves individually, but for the community at large. So we did find support and that encouraged me. Um, uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Dr. Cole. I, I was just going to say that um, there were a lot of things happening at that particular time. And uh, a lot of people were expressing themselves in a lot of different ways. I know I spent a lot of time uh, with Honore speaking with him on what was happening and what my role was going to be as I was involved. And when things ended, I did uh, receive a lot of letters of support across the United States from other organizations because I had attended other universities um, uh, during, during my reign as Miss Omaha. So we did um, vicariously and through communi other types of communication, we had support, but we knew that we, need, we were standing on our own on that particular ground of, of the university. And so we had to support each other. And I know I want to recognize the fact that a lot of people lost opportunities because of what they did. And I think those who are listening, young people need to know that when you stand up for things, there are sacrifices that can come from that. But looking back, and if you look at the people on the panel, it's well worth it. It really, um, made people stronger and from what I can tell hearing what people are doing they're doing even more and uh, that makes me proud and so I know that it's, it is very difficult uh, families um, were challenged people went back home after uh, the demonstration some people left the university and went back home and as I said before they lost jobs uh, job opportunities and they lost scholarships so I want to honor those people too because that was truly courageous and as we were reminded um, by Mrs. Hurd these were young people and we were very young then so our mindset, we had to be set on the prize, even though we knew what was going on around us with people being murdered, still a lot of lynchings. Uh, there were bills that had just been passed in 1965. That wasn't long before that. And so there with the Vietnam War, a lot of things happening around us, but we still found the courage to stand up and do whatever we could do. We couldn't change the world but we could make a difference in our space. And so I, I wanna honor those people who were, are not able to speak today. Thank you for that. So we're getting close to the end, uh, but I want to ask one final question that really ties in with what you just said, Dr. Pope. And that question is, what would you want today's student to take away from your experience? 
you know, I, I think about we all have spheres of influence. So we all have, and again, that comes from what Kathy just said, we all have our space, our spheres of influence, people that we can make a difference based on what we're doing. And I think we should all use our spheres of influence to make a positive impact on our world. You know, we live in a, in a global world, we live in a interconnected, diverse world, multicultural world. And, and, and we understand and know that there are some people who wanna take us backwards versus forward. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to, um, we have a right to protest. Uh, I, personally, I don't believe in the violence part because the violence then takes away from what we're really talking about. Then you start talking about the violence versus what you're really talking about. So to make an impact, you wanna make sure that you protest, but you protest uh, the, right, the right way. When you see something that's not right or fair, you have, you have a right to say something, you have a right to speak up, uh, you have a right to do something, you have a right to push, pull, make a little noise, whatever it takes. You have, a, you have that right, that human right to do that. Uh, I, th I think about John, Congress, Congressman uh, John Lewis, who talks about making good trouble, necessary trouble. And I believe that we sometimes we have to make good trouble and necessary trouble. And, and I could spend more time talking about the good trouble and necessary trouble I've made throughout my career in various avenues and various ways of where I've worked. And, but I've stood up for what I believe is correct and is, is right. Now, before, and I'll pick before, you back before the it. next uh, before the next person answers, uh, there were two questions in the Q and A that I missed, but they kind of tie into this question. Um, so the the first question is, how can staff and faculty in higher education support students who are involved in activism? And then, what message would you give to current UNO students who want to advance social change on campus or beyond? So that's really related to to the same question, but. Well, I feel that the staff can support the, the children and the fact that as the young people are coming and they have a need to know or want to know, then give them that information. Don't just pass them off to somebody else as it was my experience. Go find it on your own. So if you're in the department and you're there for that particular department, give them that concern of knowing that if you don't know it, you will find it and pass it on to them. And what I would like the young people to know, piggybacking off of Dr. Harris, is that if you believe or you feel that something is right, you're the one that has to address it and make sure. I would say that none action brings about no changes. So if you want to address something that's controversial, my recommendation to you is that you do it in a respectful manner that all it affects will be benefited. Don't get frustrated when you hit those obstacles. Uh, Mr. Maroney has said that many times back in 67, they kept hitting the walls, hitting the walls. So don't get discouraged because of the roadblocks and the red tape, but make your concern known and go forth with it. Um, Janice Hale, I don't know if any of you remember her. Uh, she was a very well-known professor and I would say psychologist as well. She wrote a book called Unbank the Fire. And uh, I had an opportunity to work with her uh, when she came to my school district. And my struggle was how to help the students who were coming in. They look lost and they, they were coming in from 35 different languages and so uh, culturally. And so one of the things she said was you have to introduce them to schooling. And I always wanted the university to have a, a black um, class where any incoming African-American student would not just be geared toward the student union, but they would actually be geared toward a class on how to be a black student, black schooling, uh, because in, in a white environment, it is very, very different and it's challenging and it's almost a culture shock. And so I took her advice and used it at my school. One of my schools was Lincoln High School, which I don't know if you know anything about Lincoln. It was really a notorious school. And um, we, turned th we turned a lot of the things around at that particular time. And so when I got my own school, I also 
had a class, anybody, any black student came in, had to go with their parent to that class, the beginning of it, and then they stayed throughout the semester. It made a world of difference. It, it took away a lot of the pain and the frustration. And, and they also had mentors who would attach to them and would be with them all throughout their first year. That made a big difference because they had someone to talk to that was more a confidant than, in, than a playmate. And so um, I always wanted to see that as part of the university because I know that that is helpful because you're walking into a dark space and you don't know where the challenges are. I would just offer that uh, we've come a long way in the last 50 years, but we got a long way to go. Yes. The struggle is not over, it's protracted uh, and People must find their niche in that struggle uh, and, 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 and never give up, never lose uh, hope or faith uh, because the only way we're going to win, basically, as far as I'm concerned, is together. Mm -hmm. We need each other. Sometimes we don't always understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it, it's possible if we never lose sight of, uh, as long as we keep our eyes on the prize. All right, thank you for all of that. Uh, so um, right before we end, I want to share our next program will be on Saturday, Fighting for Freedom in the Skies, World War II Black Aviators of the British Royal Air Force and the Tuskegee Airmen. That will be Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Time. Dr. Lisa Bratton, who's an associate professor at uh, Tuskegee University, and Ms. Kandasi Chimbri, who's an author in London, England. They will both be speaking about their research. So you can join us for that. So in closing, I would like to thank all of you, Dr. Hayes Harris, Reverend Williams, Mr. Maroney, Dr. Pope, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and sharing just uh, your wealth of information with us. We really appreciate it. We thank you on behalf of the Omaha 54 uh, for doing what you did to help bring about change at the university, laying the foundation for the creation of the Department of Black Studies and all these other programs at the university. It's all because of your actions. So we thank you so much. And we thank the audience for being here. And all of you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank each of you.